If anyone wants to get into this picture, joining again twice in one evening. God. Last trip we did uh, <clears throat> the metaphysical side of the three primal hypostases. Four, five, six, seven, eight. And I thought since we may not have anything else to do, I wondered whether doing this might be of interest to you. How Plotinus views the self and Plato for an insight into the divine that that is based upon his reflections and meditative practice. Would that be interesting to trace out? Or? Yes. 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 Wait a minute. If Igmar says yes, that counts, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I, like it. I said it twice, too. <coughs> twice! That <happened. laughs> right. If that's the case, how should we proceed? Igmar should read. Uh oh. The right answer is I was gonna, end of the book. Not, I was not going to ask for the honor. <laughs> but since it's been raised, I won't decline. So what would this be? Um, on going out of the body? <clears throat> okay. I have to get the book. I suspect... <clears throat> Chatter or... How about that? <clears throat> Are these capitalistic numbers or having capitalistic? Oh, good, good. <clears throat> That's kind. So, see, he's going to take what he built here, which is really the discussion of the metaphysics in the first a couple of departure points, and then he's going to build. <clears throat> and it's going to get us in a curious place because his view of Plato is essential. And he's drawing from the Timaeus. And I had it in a very good authority, let me assure you, one, a real good authority, that the way to read this section is perhaps later to go back over <laughs> Proclus's commentary on the Timaeus to take a look at section 37. Right. Of course, the whole issue of the soul, but especially up to Stephanus number 37. Now, I was, I was present in a discussion, and uh, that point was made, so I'm passing it on to you, because the uh, people... Who's the good authority? Pardon? Who's the good authority? I've been asked not to reveal it in public unless I was asked. Well, that was a question oh. that I just, yeah. Juan and Marie. All right. Right? Therefore, why don't we jump in and take a look at 10. <clears throat> right. So, we're going to pick up the idea of being in the one from his metaphysics that we looked at last time. 
and proceed. So, <clears throat> uh, as usual, uh, what we need is someone who's willing to work. Oh, uh, David? Oh, thanks, dear. Uh, I was going to give you this so you can look at the Greek as well. <laughs> Okay, good. Oh, well, wait a minute. You need another China, yeah. don't you? Wait a minute. Anyone got another for China? No, I have Thomas Taylor. Well, let's use this first. Oh, how about thank you. This is an old one. It's, this is one they used to sell them for uh, 95 cents. I'll look for the green. Okay, take them both. In the, this volume, it's on page 102, section 10. Before we start, will you read the question again? Pardon? Will you read the question on the top corner again? This? No, I got that. I'm down with that. The, your challenge. In the top right. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> How Plotinus views the self and Plato for an insight into the divine that is based upon his own reflections and meditative practice. Thank you. Okay. Shall we jump in and play? Okay, David, you got it? Well, you mean on page 10? 102 in this. I hope it's there too. That beyond? Yeah. Are you that, are you inviting me to read? Yes, please. Oh. <clears throat> that beyond being there exists the one we have attempted to prove as far as such assertion admits of proof. Wow. In the second place come being and intelligence. In the third, the soul. Now it must be admitted that as these three are in the very nature of things, they are also in us. Right? As you can see in this very sophisticated diagram. Go ahead. Okay. My meaning is not that they exist in our sense part. They are separate from sense. But what is external to sense? Understanding external in the same way that one says that they are external to the heaven. The area, that is, that Plato called the man within. Our soul too, too then, is something divine. Its nature different from that of sense. It is essentially like the soul. Possessing intelligence, it is perfect. It is necessary to distinguish between the intelligence which reasons and that which furnishes the principles of reasoning. The soul's discursive reasoning needs no bodily organ. It keeps its action pure of our bodily, of the bodily, in order to reason pure. Excuse me. It keeps its action pure of the bodily in order to reason purely. Separate from the body, it has no admixture of body. It is no mistake to place it in the first degree of the intelligible. We need not seek to locate it in space. It exists outside space. To be within oneself and exterior to all else and immaterial is to be outside body and the bodily. That is why Plato says, speaking of the cosmos, that the demiurge has the soul envelop the world from without. His meaning? A part of the soul remains in the intelligible realm. Thus, in speaking of a, the human soul, he says, it dwells at the top of the body. 
When he counsel, when he counsels separation of soul from body, he does not mean spatial separation such as is established by nature, but that soul must not incline incline towards body even in imagination, but must alienate itself from body. Such separation is achieved by raising to the intelligible realm that lower part of the soul which established in the realm of sense is the soul agent that builds up and modifies the body and busies itself with its care. Our task, we go back, hmm. right, and see what he's saying, and <coughs> take a look at how he's using this curious word, Plato. Hmm. So we go back, structure it out, find out if you're stuck anywhere, where you're stuck, why we want to follow him. Would you agree to begin with, when he worked out degrees of reality, his metaphysics, the highest, the one, the nature of being an intelligence, the <clears throat> soul, is now all of it together within us. Ah, therefore, hmm, is it possible then that it's out of a practice that he has undergone, that he discovers these things, and then makes the assertion, therefore, that these things exist in their own, in their own way, in their own right. Is that curious? <clears throat> is it possible that his metaphysics emerges out of his psychology? Is it possible that out of his psychology, which is the result of a certain practice, Using those two things, he develops, finds something to so important to him, he can make distinctions within his own practice and say, ah, that's also the nature of reality. It exists, these exist by themselves. Do it again. Is it possible that within oneself, one can discover one, two, three, discover that the soul, therefore, is divine? Therefore, therefore, capital T, world soul, not just individual soul. When he uses capital T, it's not just individual, but world soul. And in that, he can then see that therefore it must be, and necessarily, perfect. Oh, then he makes the last step. Hey, you know what? That's the first degree step into what's intelligible. Now, if that's what he's doing, how does he use Plato in this section? Can you jump into that and tell us? Go on, pull it out. First of all, is this correct? Is this what he's doing? Good. Louder? Looks good. Did I ask her if it looks good? <laughs> or, okay. <laughs> all right, are we, is, are we doing, are we following this? And within this, he then talks about who? He views the self, does he not? Good. How does Plato play a role in this? In this very section? Jump in. Plato assumes there's a soul in the cosmos. And he arranges the cosmos with an intelligible and therefore, human beings, as a model of the cosmos, have an intelligible. So, <coughs> this being is nothing other than a model of the cosmos taken as a whole. Oh, oh. See, this is the cosmos. And, of course, later, nature. Oh.
what's the significance of the term without, from without, in this one section? Can we go jump into that? He's making some curious point. To be removed from yourself as you're doing something, sort of being like in self-observation. Mm. His notice, what's nice about the text is that we can answer the question from the text, which is a good way of getting the money's worth. Does he have a line there about Plato? Yes. Does he explain it? Yes. Does he give what he thinks is his meaning? Yes. Agree? His meaning. Well, he says Plato means a part of the soul remains in the intelligible realm. Like puppets. You see, before he had it here, now he's saying the soul participates, the soul participates in the intelligible. This is the intelligible. Therefore, the soul participates in it. It's a participation. Oh. Not only that, a part of the soul, capital T, this is world soul, the whole world soul, remains in the intelligible realm. Therefore, the human soul, huh? It dwells at the top of the body. Because obviously this is Now, of course, this is a fathead. <laughs> See, Rembrandt did laugh out. Because of this, he concludes as he does. Like, why did he do this? Why did? Why is it? Why, what is the point is he making with Plato? Um, Let's ask this. To make sense of this, to, to show that this might be the case, we have to see how he came to that conclusion. I guess we have to go somewhere else, either into the time is, or to hold our breath and see whether he makes it clearer as we go on. <clears throat> Agree? Huh. Look, so, um, he put Plato in here speaking of the cosmos the demiurge has a soul enveloped the world from without his meaning part of the soul remains in the intelligible dwells at the top of the body Well, now that we know, how do you get there? Well, how do you get there? And if you get there, how can you see that what he's saying is true? Well, I'm just looking at the verb. Please. And it looks like it's part inclination, but also part duty. That because of the way things are, there's an inclination for the soul to, to be elevated. But then in the second half, but the soul must not incline towards the body, even in imagination, but must alienate itself and such separation is achieved by rising the to the intelligible realm. So that's it's part part an part of duty, part of process and, and part of a uh, structure. Yeah, this is a practice. Oh. This is something to do. And see, he's in this section on this strange guy he's concluding about from Plato. This statement, therefore, presupposes, therefore, that there should be a separation from the two. Hmm. hmm. Well, didn't uh, Plotinus... <clears throat> Pardon me? Didn't Plotinus think that there was 
one and Plato um, had thought that there was uh, two or um, no, look, stay with the quote, okay? Stay with the oh. quote. Such separation is achieved by raising to the intelligible realm the lower part of the soul. Got that? Right. Now, for anybody into Plato, this clearly is a reference to Plato's Phaedo. Phaedrus. Right. Do. Do. 60, Do. what is it, 68, <coughs> or someone like that? Anyone have Plato? Dialogues of Plato? I didn't bring it. I have it in my car. Anyone have a copy of Plato's dialogue? Plato, I got it here. Yeah. Also, the Thomas Taylor trans uh, trans that's, Taylor translation, he says Plato. That's, that's it. Okay. See if this fits. I'm on uh, uh, sixty eight Stephanus. Now, this is what he means by purification. See whether purification is a practice. See whether the practice he descri- that he describes in the purification mm-hmm. matches precisely the last section I just read. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay. And is not purification really that which has been mentioned so often in our discussion? To separate, as far as possible, the soul from the body. Uh, And to accustom it to collect itself together out of the body in every part and to dwell alone by itself as far as it can, uh, both at the present and in the future, being freed from the body as if from a prison. Now he calls this philosophical death. Right? This is the this is what philosophy is. And to set it free, as we say, is the chief endeavor of those who rightly love wisdom. And those alone, and the very care and practice of the philosophers is nothing but the freeing and the separation of the soul from the body. Don't you think so? Now is that a practice? Yes. All right, go back into, see, you take the two. Uh, Such separation is achieved by raising to the intelligible realm that lower part of the soul, which is uh, established in the realm of sense of the body. That's the soul agent field building up and modifying the body. Is that what he's doing? So he's pulling from the fail. And he's pulling from the Timaeus. If so, then we need to know more about... Uh, by the way, is there another section after 10? Yeah, 11. 11. 11. 11. And you have it right there? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, I'm looking. What page are we talking about? Uh, 103. 103. 103. I just realized I had another... Now, this is where he's going to go for the, the idea of the innate logos. Right? And he needs that because he wants to talk about the cause of intelligence and the nature of divinity and how you can understand it through the Logos. So let's jump in, okay? Since discursive reason inquires, is this just or is is that beautiful? And then decides that a particular object is beautiful or that a certain action is just, there must exist a justice that is immutable and a beauty that is immutable, according to which the soul deliberates. Otherwise, how could it reason? 
Moreover, since the soul reasons only intermittently about such topics, it cannot be discursive reason that continually possesses the idea, say, of justice. Rather, it must be intelligence. We must also possess within us the source and cause of intelligence, the divinity, which is not divisible and exists not in a place, but in itself. Not in a place, it is found in that multitude of beings capable of receiving it, just as if it were divisible, quite as the center of the circle remains in itself, while each of the points of the circles contains it, and each of the radii touches it. Thus we ourselves, by one of our parts, touch the Supreme, unite ourselves to it, and are suspended from it. We establish ourselves in it when we turn towards it. Okay. Uh, Isn't this really quite amazing, the way he proceeds with such simplicity and builds an argument in, su in such a simple and direct way? Notice how he goes from everyday experience to existence of these ideas. Right? Is that beautiful? You say, you know what? We go around, we say, is this beautiful? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is this just? Wow, that's just. I'm not sure it's just, could be. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, what's the standard you're using? Must there not be a standard you're using to make those judgments? Huh? Must exist some idea. Must exist some idea of justice. Well, by the way, must it not exist even then when we stop thinking about it, since any time we think about it, we can always think about it? It must be there in some way. Oh. 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 Well, then it must uh, be those kinds of objects which the soul deliberates unquestionably, continuously. Oh, it didn't exist. Uh, how otherwise, how could it reason unless it had those ideas? I guess those ideas exist independent of us. Hmm. Uh. Well, we only reason intermittently. Can't say that we possess it. Rather, it must be the intelligence. See, these ideas must be the intelligence. Oh, that's what it means by intelligence. At least that's what he means by intelligence, that we can come and get in touch with him in some way, to some degree, when we ask these questions and consider them. What is justice? What is beauty? Oh, 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 oh. Hey, it's not sense perception that does this. Why, it's the whole soul with all its parts that constitutes man. Huh. Each part of the soul is always alert, always engaging in its appropriate function. But we're only aware when there's a communication as well as a perception. I'm always open to this if, we're, if we are receptive to it. And when we are receptive to it. Hmm. Well, uh, say, look at that last paragraph. Yeah. Uh, care to do it, Barbara? To grasp what that which is... Is that one? The one? Yeah, yeah. To grasp what is within us, we must turn our perceptive faculties inward, focusing their whole attention there. Okay. So, when you're doing that, what do you have to do? You have to put your full attention there. Right. That's fine. Fine. I'll be darned. Go ahead. Just as the person who wants to hear a cherished sound must neglect all others and keep his ears attuned to the approach of the sound he prefers to those he hears about him, so we too must close our senses to all the noises that assail us if they are not necessary and preserve the perceptive power of the soul pure and ready to attend to tones that come from above. 
How often do we do this, beautiful and just? Whenever we see anybody, or if we see things, don't we? Mm -hmm. Any actions. How quick are we to judge injustice? Uh, have you ever driven a car? <laughs> How many jokes do you find on the highway? Too many. Right? And each time you're making a judgment about it? Mm -hmm. What? Their ability, their, uh, uh, whether or not their movements are just. That's right. So all the time you're driving and what are you doing? You're judging. That oh, stupid driver. Damn person. <laughs> Looks like an Irishman. <laughs> You know? <laughs> right? Rub two of them together and you get a fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Here, might we say, you know, that when Socrates would speak with his daemon and for at least in several instances of, of a 24-hour period in which he was in that state, that that is what Plotinus is talking about sure. when the soul has removed itself from the body yeah. to pure contemplation. And when it does remove itself from the body, this is what you're experiencing. Right. Give me a ticket. That's the game. But would you agree, he's, he's saying, he's doing what we always do. But what is he asking us? Hey, put your full attention there and take a look at what you're doing. So this is, an inter this is a low-level practice. Right, but he is giving us certain reflections, is he not? giving us this reflection, so we need something more than this. Right, that's and why you're, you're, you're calling it low level, so that's the well, prepare us for the yeah, upper... Work work. Right, right. Oh, right. well then, <laughs> I know what to do. Aha! Uh, are you equally good for going further? Sure. Well, okay. Jump in. So divine and precious is the soul, be confident that by its power you can attain to divinity. <clears throat> oh. Can we get more? Go ahead. Start your ascent. You will not need to search long. Few are the steps that separate you from your goal. Take as your guide the most divine part of the soul, that which borders upon the superior realm from which it came. Say, so he's here. <clears throat> right, he goes back to this image that we talked about before. Go ahead. Indeed, in spite of the qualities that we have shown it to have, the soul is no more than an image of the intelligence. Just as the spoken word is the image of the word in the soul, the soul itself is the image of the word in the intelligence and is the act of the intelligence by which a further level of existence is produced. <clears throat> For the act of the intelligence has this further phase, quite as fire contains heat as part of its essence, but also radiates heat. Nevertheless, the soul does not become completely separated from the intelligence. Partly, it remains in it. Although its nature is distinct because it derives from the intelligence, the soul is itself an intellective existence. Discursive reason is the manifestation of its intellectual capacity. The soul derives its perfection, derives its perfection from the intelligence, which nourishes it as a father would. But in comparison with itself, the intelligence has not endowed the soul with complete perfection. Thus, the soul is the hypostasis that proceeds from the intelligence. Its reason finds its actualization when it contemplates the intelligence. So contemplating, it possesses the object of its contemplation within itself as its own, and it is then wholly active. These intellection, intellectual and interior activities are alone characteristic of the soul. Those of a lower kind are due to an alien principle, and they are passive rather than active experiences for the soul. The intelligence makes the soul more divine because it is its begetter and grants its presence to it. Nothing separates the two 
but the difference of their natures. The soul is related to the intelligence as matter is to idea. But this matter of the intelligence is beautiful. It has an intellectual form and is partless. How great then must the intelligence be if it is greater than the soul? something curious here, don't you? Um, the idea of image. Can you, get the sen- can you get the sentence where they're talking about the image? The soul itself is the image of the word? Mm-hmm. Just as the spoken word is the image of the word in the soul, The soul itself is the image of the word in the intelligence and is the act of the intelligence by which a further level of existence is produced. So, how would you describe the relationship between the (coughs) image and its object? It's a reflection. Of the object. Well, perception. Well, (coughs) when might you see these two terms? When might they be useful? And what kinds of models? Painting. Painting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Give it to me. Well, a painter would have an object of its, of uh, his, that he wants to reproduce an image of. Now, most people lack the the, uh, skill in anatomy that I show. And please ignore the fact that all my figures are nudes. That's a Greek tradition. It is kind of distracting, though. I I know it's distracting. (laughs) Okay, now look here. Why is, what does this mean? What is this mean? This is a controlling image. There are several controlling images. Uh, Is there something that is lost when it goes from here to here? Absolutely. Hey, you know what? Suppose for a moment um, just deal with this possibility. What if, um, what if, what if there's a model of man? No, I'm going to use the word model. I want to take that out. Archetype. Uh, Would that mean then that... uh, Lightness? Would this be perfect? No. Would this be perfect if it's the uh, archetype? Hmm. Hmm. I need a good answer. Uh, It would would be closer than where we are. If it's the archetype, it would be... It would have to be... Yeah, I think it would be perfect. Perfect? Or as close to as the perfection as could be. Uh, source, mm-hmm. then this would be an image of it. An image. I see, I see. Then this would be an image. And this would be its object or model. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Now the word model works in two ways, so let me not use that word. Right? 
Uh, let's call it a source object. And we're still dealing with image and object, are we not? Uh, by the way, did the object turn into an image? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, could this be uh, an image? An image? Mm -hmm. Indeed. And then that means there must be a... Uh, Something more perfect? Further source object or... Further. There must then be a... Uh, Even better one. Source of the source. Uh, all archetypes into a unity, <coughs> of which this is only one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or the union of all archetypes? And therefore its source? Then this would be what? The one. Model. And then what happened to our other uh, model? Uh, it became a... It becomes an image. Oh. Are we, are we doing a regression here? No. Now here's the whole problem of metaphysics. you got it right Ascension. down. So. Can you go the next step? So this is now also a copy. You see? Mm-hmm. Well, what, I, what I'd like you to, to play with just for a moment is what is lost in each successive passages? Something is retained, is it not? I mean, something is retained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But something is lost at each step. Is it possible then that the whole metaphysics is nothing other than model, copy, copy, model, 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 copy, copy, model, 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 <laughs> copy, all, all the way down? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the emotion missing? Now, or what's no. brilliant about Proclus, you see, is that he makes this transition from each of these that we're calling model copy or object on its copy. He says these steps are really the diffusion of light from the pure and most brilliant light of being. And each one of these stages going from one to the other must have one principle in common to it all, likeness. Ah, if so, then, the controlling idea in his metaphysics is likeness. All right, categories of copy model. Oh, by the way, that's likeness, isn't it? Right? I mean, if, that went, if the very idea of likeness were, be, were to be nullified, then you couldn't have a relationship between model and copy, could you? No. No, oh, likeness, therefore, the more no primary likeness. idea must be the masterful idea of likeness. Hmm. And <laughs> unlikeness, because anything that's like also has an unlike. Oh, then, then these would be the forms, is that right? Or uh, mm -hmm. Platonic forms? Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh. If so, then where we are, uh, you want to reverse the process, don't you? The whole game is reversing the process. And he's saying the gap between the two, the gap between pure being, which is the most brilliant light of being in, Pro in Plato and in Proclus, there's just a slight difference. But we're saying, say, wake up, wake up, and put your attention upon it. And when you do that, that's separating the soul from the body. No one can certainly be involved in these kinds of peculiar questions and explorations. Is, is that right? Is that what he's doing? Look, go back to copy. See, he even puts in the idea in the soul of reason functioning, so he gets within it another model copy, doesn't he?
the soul does not uh, become completely separated from the intelligence. Part of it remains in it, although its nature is distinct from it, it derives from the intelligence. The soul is, is an active and intellective existence. Discursive reason is the manifestation of its intellectual capacity. The soul derives its the soul derives its perfection from the intelligence. Oh. So perfection is always in, wherever it is, it's always in its prior. Ah. Well, that's rather peculiar. Um. Well. I guess we need to know more about his reflections to see if we can make this clearer, especially on how to make this transition from where we are to our prior. Is there another section before three? <laughs> Two. Two. Oh, good. Good. This is a good one. This is a good one. Uh, two and four really go together. <coughs> I should probably say that. So, let's do two. Right. Who wants to play with two? Thank you! <clears throat> now this is his reflection and becomes a meditation. So, so you master it and then you do it. Each each should recall at the outset that soul is the author of all living things. Wow. Has breathed life into them all on earth, in the air, and in the sea, the divine stars, the sun, the ample heavens. It was soul that brought order into the heavens and guides now its measured revolving. All this it does while yet remaining transcendent to what it gives form, movement, life. Necessarily it is superior by far to them. They are born or they die to the extent that soul gives or withdraws their life. Soul, because it can never abandon itself, exists eternally. Okay, this is a beautiful restatement of the time years, which we can easily get into since it's only 28 to 37 between the two. Okay, jump in. Now, to understand how life is imparted to the universe and to each individual, the soul must rise to the contemplation of the soul, the soul of the world. The individual soul, though different from the soul, is itself no slight thing, yet it must become worthy of this contemplation. Freed of the errors and seductions to which other souls are subject, it must be quiet. Let us assume that quiet too is the body that wraps it round. Quiet the earth, quiet the air and the sea, quiet the high heavens. Then picture the soul flowing into this tranquil mass from all sides, streaming into it, spreading through it until it is luminous. As the rays of the sun lighten and gild the blackest cloud, so the soul, by the soul, by entering the body of the universe, capital soul, gives it life and immortality. The abject it lifts up. The universe, moved eternally by an intelligent soul, becomes blessed and alive. The soul's presence gives value to a universe that before was no more than an inert corpse, water and earth, or rather darksome matter and non-being, an object of horror to the gods, as someone has said. The soul's nature and power reveals themselves still more clearly in the way it envelops and rules the world in accordance with its will. It is present in every point of the world's immense mass, animating all its segments, great and small. While two bodies cannot be in the same place and are separated from each other both spatially and otherwise, the soul is not thus extended. It need not divide itself to give life to each particular individual. Although it animates particular things, it remains whole and is present in its wholeness, resembling in this indivisibility and omnipresence its begetter, the intelligence. It is through the power of the soul that this world of multiplicity and variety is held within the bonds of unity. It is through its presence that this world is divine. Divine the sun because and soul. <coughs> so too the stars. And whatever we are, we are in its we are on its account, 
for a corpse is viler than a dunghill. The deities owe their divinity to a cause necessarily their superior. superior. Our soul is the same as the soul which animates the deities. Strip it of all things infesting it, consider it in its original purity, and you will see it to be of equal rank with the soul superior to everything that is body. The body without the soul is nothing but earth. If one make fire the basic element, one still needs a principle to give life to its flame. It is the same even if one combines earth and, and fire or adds to them water and air as well. If it is soul that makes us lovable, lo pardon me, if it is soul that makes us lovable, why is it that we seek it only in others and not in ourselves? You love others because of it. Love then yourself. <laughs> is there a meditation in there? Is there a good one? Yeah, that's a good one. It is a meditation. Okay, look at it, okay? Hey, um, how do you understand this? If you want to understand this, what do you have to do? Learn Greek. <laughs> Get nuts. Rise to the level of that. He says, hey, want to understand this? Contemplate it. <coughs> Want to understand this? Get into contemplation. That's what he's telling us. Look at the way he does it. You've got to become worthy. Yeah, yeah. Worthy of this contemplation. Freed of the errors and seductions. It must be quiet, right? Look at that. The soul must be quiet. Let us assume that quiet too is the body that wraps it round, quiet the earth, Quiet the air, the sea, quiet the high heavens. Ah, then picture the soul flowing into this tranquil mass from all sides, streaming into it, spreading through it until it's luminous. As the rays of the sun lighten and gild the darkest clouds, so the soul by entering the body of the universe Gives it life and immortality. Hey, do that, you know what? Then you'll see the universe is moved eternally by an intelligent soul. It becomes blessed and alive. Soul gives uh, value to the universe. His conclusion, do it, then you'll see. Hey, you know what? The soul's, na you know what? The soul's nature and power? Reveal themselves. You're not doing it. The soul's nature and power reveal it, reveal themselves still more clearly in the way it envelops and rules the world according to its will. So therefore, this is his way he then reflects how he understands, the way you then get into a meditative practice to confirm, hey, what are you doing? You're verifying or, or confirming his metaphysics. You do it, you do it, and you'll see all of this is within yourself. If it's within yourself, you'll see it as a reality, therefore it's also outside of yourself. Therefore, not necessarily outside of yourself, it exists in its own right. Whether it's in you or not, outside, inside, doesn't make any difference. Ah, what's that called? Understanding for him. This is the way to understand the system. Do it. So therefore he's inviting us, is he not? Hmm. So therefore, this is why you have to examine the nature of the soul. Because it's all in there. And that's what he's saying in the first section, and then we can go back to the fourth section to pull in his great contemplation, another one in section four. So we push into one. Is that fair? Okay. You say, hey, you know what? If this is the way things are, how come we forgot it? Is that what you said? You sure? Good question. Yeah. Well, this is a sorry state of affairs. How is it then that the souls forgot the divinity that they got them, so that divine by nature, divine by origin, 
for they now know neither divinity nor self. This evil that has befallen them has its source in self-will, will, in being born, in becoming different, in desiring to be independent. Once having tasted the pleasures of independence, they use their freedom to go in a direction that leads them away from their origin. And when they have gone a great distance, they even forget that they came from it. Like children separated from their family since birth and educated away from home, they are ignorant now of their parentage and therefore of their identity. Our souls know neither who nor whence they are because they hold themselves cheap and accord, and accord their admiration and honor to everything except themselves. They bestow esteem, love, and sympathy on anything rather than on themselves. They cut themselves off as much as may be from things above. They forget their work. Ignorance of origin is caused by excessive valuation of sense objects and disdain of self. For to pursue something and hold it dear implies acknowledgement of inferiority to what is pursued. As soon as the soul thinks it is worth less than the things subject to birth and death, considers itself least honorable and enduring of all, it can no longer grasp the nature and power of the divinity. A soul in such condition can be turned about and led back to the world of oh, human. <clears throat> a soul in such condition can be turned about and led back to the world above and the supreme existence, the one, the first, by a twofold debt discipline, by showing it the low value of the things it esteemed at present, and by a form, informing, reminding it of, the, of its nature and worth. The second discipline precedes the first, once made clear, supports the first, which we shall treat elsewhere rather, for, uh, rather fully. The second must occupy us now, particularly as it is a prerequisite for the study of that supreme object we desire to know. It is the soul that desires to know. Therefore, the soul must first examine its own nature in order to know itself and decide whether it is capable of such an investigation, has an eye capable of such seeing, and whether such seeking is its function. If the things it seeks are alien to the soul, what good will its seeking do? But if the soul is akin to them, and it seeks them, it can find them. So his object is to show you that the soul is akin to the very things you're seeking. That's his goal. Okay, then I'll give you his reflections. Ah. Oh. Interesting uh, piece of work. Why are we skipping four? Pretty nice translations. Oh, well, I like four, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Actually, the first two paragraphs. The greatness of the intelligence may also be seen in this. See, now he's moving to the intelligence. We marvel at the magnitude and beauty of the sense world, the eternal regularity of its movement, the divinities, visible, invisible, that it contains, its daemons, animals, plants. Let us then rise to the model of, to the higher reality from which the world derives, and let us there contemplate the whole array of intelligibles that possess eternally an inalienable intelligence and life. Over them presides pure intelligence, unapproachable wisdom. That's Kronos. That world is the true realm of Kronos, whose very name suggests abundance and intelligence. There is contained all that is immortal intelligence and divine. Now, that's the place of every soul. So tell me, what do you think of the God? Brings you into it and makes you want to get into it, shames you for not doing it. <laughs> that's a translation. Yeah. The guy's a genius, isn't he? He's your buddy. No. This is a, yeah, this is a good translation, too. Therefore, we can expect similar work from people that we know. By the way, do you know any group? So, yeah, I'm going to translate this entire work. You know, I'll have it done by next time. <laughs> okay. You're going to do one? I'm, I've already started, so. You have? Yeah. Which, which one? 
This one. Oh, good. How do you find it? It's great. It's, it's simple, well, too. It's very Can you tell us what you see in terms of what our author is doing? O'Brien? Yeah, you he's using them. You're doing thing. with the Greek, I presume. So What's that? Then you have a nice insight in how O'Brien is translating. Well, uh, yeah, but I, I mean, yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit that I looked at tonight. No, you do it by hour. I just looked at a few of the lines that we've been looking at tonight. <clears> and <throat> So I can't say, you know, that I'm so We can expect more though next week, can't we? Grasping oh, yeah. all of it. Wait a minute, is that fair? I think it's very fair. Yeah. 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 I have a whole week. Seven days. Come on. <coughs> oh, thank you. Brad, what did you say? <laughs> I was just um, congratulating him on his new assignment and project. <laughs> thank you, brother. What did you say on the word? Want to go back to some section? Um, it's amazing to me how short and simple and Bad profound hunger. it all is. Pretty robust too. Yeah. How about yeah. Short? <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's so simple and, and spurring. Yeah. Oh. That means, therefore, he must be pretty familiar with the things that he's talking about. Can reduce it to such pure simplicity, represent it with such clarity. Yeah, really so. beautiful. It's kind of matter of fact. Like, hey, stupid, listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. It's by the way, it's, uh, it's it's only you're only just a short distance away from what we're talking about. Yeah. Did you forget it? How did you forget it? Oh, that's right. So it's like it's like di didactic in that way, right? Like. Like he's speaking immediately to the reader's soul. Right? He's like, "Hey, just a little bit of while, like a like an elder brother or something, you know, or yeah. kindly father." Yeah, he's yeah. being a master, in other words. Oh, yeah, you were jumping in. Oh, uh, I was, you know, thinking about the the business of of remembering. Yes, and Ooh. the the issue that the facts of human physiology in relationship to the child's ability as they grow to have the capacity to do this would seem to me to have some influence on the issue of remembering. Because if the soul, you know, is animating and maintaining the body through its growth, at least from my observation of children, their capacity to do this is not, you know, until a certain age to remember and to be capable of doing this kind of intellection. No, well, that's, that's uh, curious because uh, um, some scenes. we have a grandson, uh, the latest one. Uh, son, we got a granddaughter just recently, more recent, but grandson. And he goes through the garden. Uh, wow, wow, wow. Right, he goes by a rose. Wow. <laughs> Picks up a rock. Wow. <laughs> so we changed his name. He got his mother's approval. We're going to call him Wower. 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 <laughs> How often does he do it? Mm -hmm. Often. Often. Yeah. Oh, that's right, pretty good. Finds the whole universe. Wow. Catch him. Wow. Yeah, hope he doesn't lose it. So we have a way of making sure he won't. If he loses, it will spank the hell out of him. <laughs> no? em embarrass him no? in a trivial pursuit. Give him a beer. <laughs> Wait a minute, give him a beer? <coughs> Better than spank him. <laughs> no. okay. Come on, what else is there? Come on. Okay, Rhonda. It's just that, like, along with Brad, it's just so simple and beautiful and reminding you that you're so close. You know, it, it, uh, yeah. you don't have to go a distance. Yeah. It's here right now. Very well. 
I think also he's also it's actually closer than so close. Mm. It, it's a part of rather than a closeness. It's it's already there. It's already there. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. already there. It's yeah. just sort of look up. Uh, um, now, um, We need really, uh, we need a break and uh, doing so much work. So why don't we uh, do beauty next time? Good thing to do, doesn't it fit? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Why does this three, two, one thing work so well? I'm glad you asked. Right, Nancy? <laughs> I didn't put those numbers up there. <laughs> you should Don't know. let a little thing like that stop you. I figure you got so tired of reading it forward, you decided to read it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a peculiar way of reading. That's why I did it that way. Does that answer it? No. No, let's see if he accepts it. Yeah. Uh-oh. Well, does, did this help? Now we go back to the original statement. Now remember, there, there's a whole section, uh, and other sections that we read, we could equally have said he's coming out of Timaeus. So his thought follows this, Phaedo, of course, but it's heavy into uh, Plato's time is the whole section on the soul or up to the soul. And uh, um, you know what that means. We can uh, ask our volunteers to do that whole section and come in and help us discuss it. Do you want to lead the group? Sure. So, uh, and you'll work with? Daniel and Marty. Daniel and? Marty. Marty, okay. Which and section? And we need backup. Uh, who do you think we should get to be a backup one? Oh. Good. <coughs> All right, okay. Chris Olson, that's real good. And also, David? Okay. I didn't Brad? suggest it, he did. On beauty? Yeah. I'll do my best. <laughs> this is made for you, isn't it? Isn't that great? Okay, let's take a break. <laughs> mm -hmm.